it's uh, it's good to be back with everyone, and I hope that um, I hope that everyone's doing well considering the situation that we we find ourselves in. Um, uh, it's been tough for some people, and um, and obviously we got to keep the family in prayer who have been in that accident. Uh, what's that saying? No, no good deed goes unpunished, unfortunately. And um, so we just pray and ask the Lord to to please uh, help help them with that. Um, from our side, we've been good. Our family um, overall, um, we've had our own uh, situations with this COVID problem. Um, Claudia's dad and um, her sister and his girlfriend have contracted the virus and um, it hit them quite hard. Well, actually just a dad and his girlfriend, um, her younger sister's okay, but it hit them quite hard. And, um, you know, he's quite old, but he's one of those old, old tough bullies that okay. won't go to the doctor, won't speak to the nurse, won't want anybody to help him. But fortunately they got him to, a, to the hospital at, at, um, at a good time and he's doing much better. So we praise the Lord for that. Right. Um, but uh, for those who have, who knew about that and have been praying, thank you so much. It's definitely helped. He's recovered quite a bit. And um, we just praise the Lord for, for his leading. Our church is doing well too, Clement Church. We're moving from strength to strength, still doing the streaming, like second service, and still trying to support one another, um, even though we can't be face to face. Um, and uh, we're just trying to focus a lot more on preparing for what else is coming. Um, I read about a whole new disease that has just spread in China. So I, I don't know if that's coming here, hopefully not. But all we can do is pray and ask God for help. For those of you who, who joined in last time that I, I presented for second service, um, we looked at the life of Abram and, um, and how his faith was built up over time and how God used um, difficulties in his life to show him the problems that he had um, in himself. He, he did not fully trust God the way he was supposed to yet. And one of the things we learned is that God uses difficult times to grow our faith. And in teaching that, I was going through my own stuff. And that's why I focused on that. And it's amazing how um, things transpired over the last few weeks not just the family situation with Claudia's dad being sick, that certainly knocked us as well, um, but also just at uh, other, other areas of life. Um, and it affected things like uh, my prayer life and um, um, quiet time with God. You know, so what's, what's funny is that previously I'm talking about these things, saying how we must build up our faith regardless of the situation we're going in. And then immediately after that, I, as a family, we go through all these problems. And it was a huge test of where we stand with God. Um, so we're going, to looking at, we're going to be looking at that a bit more, um, trying to figure out um, what the Bible teaches about faith and how we can make it through these, these type of times. Um, but if, it's, if, if you're going through the, the things that some people are going through, it's very hard to stick to what the Bible teaches, right? The Bible teaches that regardless of the environment we find ourselves in, our faith must be growing at all times. The Bible teaches that, in fact, Paul writes in um, Colossians. Sorry, I had to just rectify myself there. Paul writes in Colossians and Ephesians um, to the churches there that you must be continually growing. And going through the last few weeks, I started actually asking God and praying like, man, I just talked about these things, but these problems seem to be compiling or compounding, getting bigger and bigger at work. Um, someone has just been, uh, I don't want to say demoted, but their responsibilities have changed. And so now I've got my own work that I have to deal with, but I also have to take on their responsibilities as well. That's hiring team members and um, working with clients and all sorts of stuff. So my time for work has gone from seven, eight hours to 12, 13 hours a day. Um, but I still have to spend time with my, with my kids. Um, I still have to help out Claudia around the house, you know, my wife. And more importantly, I still have to um, spend time with God, which is the priority above everything else. So at the same time, I'm trying to tell people about this, but I'm going through my own 
battles, which maybe in future I'll look back at it and think it wasn't such a big deal. But right now it does seem overwhelming where I have to have responsibilities at work, at family and at church. So you have people messaging me on WhatsApp saying, hey, man, I can't deal with life right now and all these things. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm in the same boat. That's the, the, the reality of Christianity. Um, we do sometimes think that the theory in the Bible, the things that we read in from Paul or from Luke or from John are just going to play out in this very simple way. But the truth is we, we struggle with day-to-day -day things. But that's the stuff that God wants to help us with. Now, I don't know what's happening with you. Um, if you're having a similar experience, you know that you are struggling with life issues when they take up a lot of thoughts in your head. They take up a lot of headspace. Uh, a couple of nights I tried to lay down and go sleep. And I just have work running, running in my head. So I have to get up at 2 a.m., make notes so I can just go sleep. You know, they, one of the things I tell you is that if you're thinking about something a lot, write it down so you can get it out your head and you can go back to sleep. Um, so I don't know if you have something that, that you're struggling with that has been bothering you. I don't know if you have a job situation, a family situation. I don't know if someone's been in an accident like the Tofi family. I don't know if you have a new child, um, like the, the baby that was born, a beautiful baby that was born. Um, you know, that comes with its own set of problems and challenges. I don't know if it's, if uh, you're having to take on all the load around you because you're the person that people look to for strength. I've got a friend at church, at Claremont Church. His name is Seth, wonderful guy. He's helping us out with the technical stuff like streaming. And uh, he was very quiet for two weeks, just nothing going on. And I'm messaging him, uh, Seth, what's going on? We can't get hold of you. And he was suffering in silence because it turns out that his uncle, who is very close to, very, very close to, was almost a father to him, had passed away because of COVID-19. And he told nobody because he's the person that people always look to for help. So he felt he had to keep it to himself. Um, and then while I'm chatting to him about this on a call, uh, because the Lord was just telling me, please get hold of Seth, get hold of Seth, you know. While I'm chatting to him, he tells me, oh, no, no, that's only his one uncle. He's got another uncle that's in hospital for the same thing. And, and so we have people who we tell him, trust in the promises of God. Believe what God says in the Bible. Let not your heart be troubled, like John 14 says. But they're going through real problems in life. And we, we have to support them. So I don't know if you are in that situation. Uh, I just want to share my screen quickly. Uh, let's see if I get this right. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, guys, let me know if you can see that. Yep. Got it. Thanks, Kate. Got it. Yep. Um, okay. Let me get to the next screen. Now, if you're looking at that, that's a nice meme I found online. And I think it sums up 2020 perfectly. <laughs> I, I uh, at the beginning of each year and leading up to the 1st of Jan, I sit down and I write down all my goals for the year. And um, like an idiot, almost as if I'm going to figure everything out. Like everything's just going to work out. On this date, I'm going to have this project done. On that date, you know, we're going to do all these things. And none of them have panned out. None of them. Um, I think there's like one I've managed to do, right? But I feel like uh, the guy on the, on the right, not the guy on the left, the guy on the right that's just crying his eyes out, trying to make things work. By the way, that's the same person. I think, I think it's Matthew McConaughey or something like that. He's got a weird last name. But that's the same person from two different movies. And I feel like the guy on the right. That's, that's me in a nutshell right now, trying to get everything done, trying to get everything sorted. But in spite of this, there are certain expectations that God has of us. And Paul explains this quite nicely. You can go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm not going to, you don't have to, to read through all the verses. I'm just going to highlight a few things. Feel free to write it down. But Ephesians chapter 5 is Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And he's talking to the believers there as they're going through difficult times themselves. 
What's interesting is that Paul is writing this letter while he's in prison. And uh, it's, the, it's the craziest thing because we have prison ministry. Right? You go to prison as a believer and you try to, to uh, motivate the people there. You try to um, get them to, to still be excited about life and God and, and trust in God and all things. But you find Paul doing the opposite. He's writing to the believers trying to motivate them. And we're going to look at a few things that he tells him. Now, remember, he's in prison while he's writing this. He's a troublemaker as a Christian, so he's in prison. And um, he's writing to the believers. And at the time, if you were a Christian, you were not safe. Right? It's not like it is today where you can call yourself a Christian. And Christianity has grown so much. At that time, you were viewed as a troublemaker. And you were the one causing problems for pagans and all these things. And also, the life at that time for a normal Christian citizen was very difficult. Murder was rife. Um, uh, vice was rife. Um, uh, at the time when he wrote this, the Romans had fought some rebellion and tried to defend their city. And 70,000 Roman soldiers, soldiers died. That was normal life for Christians during that time. Not to mention disease, poverty, and sometimes lack of food because of all sorts of things going on there. And he's writing to them. And here are the things that Paul says. So keep all of that context in mind. This is what Paul says. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. And again, we're going to skip over a few things. But become imitators of God as well-beloved children, meaning copy him and follow his example. Verse 2, and walk continually in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. So practice empathy, compassion, be unselfish. Ephesians 5 verse 8, we're going to skip a few. For once you were in darkness, but now you are in light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. And just to sum that up, it is to live with the new moral compass. Before you come to, before you get to know Christ, you make decisions that are really bad and they, you're sinful and all that stuff. But now that you know Christ, you make decisions with a new moral compass. You don't steal, you don't cheat, you don't lie, you don't do any of those things. Verse 15, therefore, see that you walk carefully, not as the unwise, but as wise. And what that means is living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. And you yourself are making wise decisions as Christ would. Verse 16, Making the very most of your time, because the days are filled with evil. So recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom, not only to develop your faith, but to help others um, learn about Christ as well. Okay, so this is in the context of a Roman Christian citizen, someone living in Ephesus with all the problems that they are facing. Paul does not say, guys, it's okay. It's okay. There's some things you can do. It's okay to cheat if you need to. If you need food, go steal it. Don't worry, you can do that. It's totally okay. If someone asks if you're a Christian, you can lie to them about that. That's not what, what Paul says. He says the standard is actually higher. And then he sums this all up by saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. So let's just recap. Be imitators of God. Now, this is Paul's expectations of them at Ephesus. And keeping in mind, they don't have the Bible like we have it. They don't have all of this. Right? We've got the Old and the New Testament. We've got everything wrapped up nicely for us. We've got Desire of Ages, Patriarchs and Prophets. We've got hymns and choruses, all these different things. All they had at the time was Paul's letters and, and teachings from the disciples. But Paul sums it up here. Be imitators of God. Be unselfish, compassionate, be obedient, and use your time wisely. And then he sums it up with, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is there's no time to relax as a Christian and fall back into old habits because of what you are going through. There's no time, or there's no time to look at your life. I'm thinking about the Tofi family now that we're in that accident. Anybody else in that accident might say, you know what? I do welfare for God. I help the poor, all these things, and God gets me into this accident. Paul's saying there's no time for thinking like that. We are expected to exercise 
further growth in Jesus. And especially being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's expectations are. Now you might be thinking to yourself like, is that fair? Is it fair that we still have this high standard that we have to reach, even with all the problems going on around us? Just keep that in mind, that question. Before we answer this one, why is the Holy Spirit important? Um, I got a call from someone, um, uh, not a call, sorry, a Facebook message from someone in the week. This is a friend of mine from many years ago. I have not spoken to her in years. And all it was was just hi. That's all it was. And when I saw it, uh, for, some, for some reason, uh, in my head, the first thing that popped in was uh, she's got some problem that's, uh, that's going on. So I messaged back and said, hey, how can I help you? The last message I sent her was in 2012, and it was to encourage her to trust in God. That was the last message, 2012. So she, she, she sends this message and um, I finally get on a call and we start chatting. And um, she basically lost a job because she can't cope at work. She's been diagnosed with bipolar and severe depression. And um, what she, what she, she's on medication. She's running out of money. She's essentially been fired or been forced to resign. And just when she was about to get a new job, um, COVID happens and that company can't employ anymore. And on the phone, she's in tears, crying, and, and obviously you know the question that she's going to ask. Right? Everybody who goes through a difficult time and is a Christian asks this, this one. They, they, they ask, why did this happen to me? Why am I going through this? I pray every day. I trust in God, do all these things. And I was listening and listening and trying to, you know, just comfort her and give her support where I can. And, and obviously I help her out with, with something real, like food and stuff like that, because she, she, she has to support her kid and all these things. And she's having to get food from neighbors and stuff like that, pay rent and, and all these things, real issues. And um, what dawned on me was that we sometimes lose out on a step. And that step we lose out on in our Christian walk is this one here. Why the Holy Spirit is so important to our faith. And we're going to get into a little bit of that now. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 25, gives us a bit of insight into what the Holy Spirit helps us with. And we normally call this the fruit of the Spirit. And this is verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, is love, 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 joy, goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, if you go back to those, those first few slides where we looked at Paul's expectations for the church at Ephesus, it says, be imitators of God, be obedient, um, be thankful, um, trust in the Lord. Right? He mentioned all these things. And now we look at the, the fruit of the Spirit, and we're just going to break it down to make it easier for us to look at. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All these things come um, via the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible uh, Galatians says that these things come encapsulated and packaged for us via, via the Holy Spirit. We can't pick one of them. I can't say I'm just going to be joyful and patient. I'm not going to have self-control. It comes all together wrapped up for us. And these things, if you look at them, will remind you of Jesus. Jesus was loving. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 5. Love as Jesus loved. Jesus was full of joy, regardless of the situation he found himself in. Jesus himself said that in me, you will have peace. Jesus was patient. Um, there are some passages in the New Testament that says that even when he was tempted by the Pharisees and those who hated him, even when he was nailed on the cross, he still showed patience and kindness. He refused to retaliate. Jesus was filled with goodness. Obviously, Jesus was faithful. We learn that he's the author and finisher of our faith. 
And last one I want to mention there is that he has self-control. We know that because he was perfect. He committed no sin. So when we have the fruit of the Spirit, which comes via the Holy Spirit, we actually take on the characteristics of Jesus, where we are willing to be faithful regardless of, of what we're going through. So I want to go to the next slide. So just to recap quickly, everything we need, we find in the fruit of the Spirit, those characteristics. And these are the characteristics of Jesus himself. Okay, Faith being one of them, self-control, all those things. And these things, Paul says, have to be in you. People need to see these things in you, even when you are in prison, when you are struggling, when you are going through something difficult, when you've lost your job or something like that. These things have to be in you. And that's a tough call. That's a very tough call. It's a very tough call. It's a high standard that we have to be at. So again, to walk like Jesus is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's someone that I think encapsulates this. This is Pastor Gomez. Um, he is based in El Salvador. And why I put him up here is he uh, used to be a gang member. Um, from a very young age, 13 up until 18. At the age of 18, he was already in prison. And um, he was uh, part of a gang, a very powerful gang known as MS-13. They terrorized villages and towns. And by 18, he was behind bars, had no family, had no friends. And um, eventually gave himself to the Lord. He made a promise to God. He asked, told God that if you help me find my way outside of prison, because in prison, you know, there's a lockdown. They, they have very little they can do. So it's easy to be faithful. I think Korba said that with his song. It's easy to be faithful in some instances, but it's when you're outside and where he was concerned. He was worried about what would happen to him outside of prison. Fortunately, a church came looking for him. They had been studying the Bible with him via via. Um, while he was in prison. And as soon as he was released, they were outside waiting for him. They were outside waiting and they said, look, we're going to take you in. We are, you're going to come live with us. We're going to look after you from now onwards. Um, and we're going to help you grow as a Christian. So um, this is the next slide after that. This is not Pastor Gomez on the right. That's just someone else from his church. But on the left, you will see the type of people that he works with. The person on the left is a typical MS-13 gang member. They tattoo themselves up and the tattoos represent the crimes that they've done. And it represents the people that they've hurt. So they, they, they celebrate hurting people. That's what they believe in. But to date, the churches in that area have converted 1,500 gang members to Christianity. So people who were at 13 and 14 years old, murdering, robbing, raping, assaulting people, all that stuff. That's what they did at such a young age, have now turned their lives around because of the fruit of the Spirit. They now are kind. They are now patient. They show self-control. They are used to going into anybody's home and taking what they want. Some of them now work at the church bakery to support the whole program. The church has a bakery and they all work there free of charge. They don't get paid. And they all live in this little dormitory and they each get a little mat that they sleep on every night. But they do not want to leave that place because that's where they found Christ. The bread of life while they're making bread for other people, which I found interesting. So I just want to go back to... to uh, what we were talking about before this. And I want to make sure that we, we sort of stay on the key things because one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, how do we then get that fruit of the Spirit? How do we get the Holy Spirit to, to be in us? And the, the truth is that the Bible actually answers this question. And that's the best part. It's not something that's actually hard to do. If you go with me to, to John chapter 14, I'm not going to show it on the screen. We can just go there in our Bibles. 
And we can look at John chapter 14, verse 13, 14, and 16. Okay. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is Jesus talking. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Okay? So first of all, Jesus establishes that whatever you ask in his name, he will do. And he takes it even further by saying that I will send you the helper, the Holy Spirit. So let's just stay there. Then Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says, If you then who are evil, talking about us, normal people, we are sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Let's just take a moment to, to think about that. So Christ says, I will give you anything if you pray in my name. And he's talking about anything good and anything related to obedience and faith and those things. And not just that, I will send you the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the spirit of truth, the helper. And he will help you with your obedience and your faithfulness. And all we have to do, according to Luke chapter 11, is we have to pray and ask God for the Holy Spirit. And if we ask God for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help us with the fruit of the Spirit, which is the characteristics of Jesus. So as we, as we look at the things around us that are happening, if I look at my friend who doesn't have money, doesn't have food in the house, lost a job, is struggling with depression and, and bipolar, is just trying to get money to pay for medication, I should be praying for her, not only that she trusts more in God, but that the Holy Spirit fills her. There's obviously Amen. practical things that I can do as well. I've got to actually try and help her, which myself and Claudia have done. But more than that, I need to ask God that he fills her with the Holy Spirit to build up her faith. I have to do the same for anyone else who's going through these sort of things thinking about my friend Seth at church, I promised him on the call that Seth, you know, I will pray for you and I'll pray that the Holy Spirit helps you build up your faith. This is one of the key things that as Christians, we, we tend to forget. We pray for our problems as we should. We pray for other people's problems as we should. We should also be asking God to help us be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can have the fruit of the Spirit. I just want to move on in my notes. As we go um, into this week and as we go into the rest of the day, I'd like to, to leave it here. There's obviously a lot more that we can cover. And there's a lot more that we, we have to learn about the Holy Spirit and about faith and about difficulties that we, that we go through. All of us, we all know someone who has been struck by, by the problems facing humanity right now. And I'd like to ask that we all pray consistently on a daily basis, in our quiet time, whenever we take the time out to be with the Lord. That we not only pray for those who are going through these things, but we, we pray that they may develop the fruit of the Spirit and that they may be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And I also pray that we, Second Service, myself, my wife, Claremont Church, that we all keep praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All of this can be, can be summed up nicely in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. We Paul writes to the church at Colossae saying, we have to walk like Christ walked. Rooted, established in the faith. Having hearts filled with thanksgiving. Being content with our lot in life. Not ignoring the difficulties that are going on around us. Not ignoring people who are in trouble but still looking to Jesus um, as the author and finisher of our faith. And I'd like to leave it here for today. 
Um, let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. Very short one before we carry on. And if you feel that you need more of the Holy Spirit and you need more of the faith that Christ had to be just like a Pastor Gomez, to, be, to, to overcome the challenges that we face, to overcome the difficulties that we face, then bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, we pray and thank you so much for the testimony of Pastor Gomez, who has so far helped convert 1,500 jail members, prisoners who lived a life of crime. Lord, we, we also know of people that are going through similar things, even worse. Some of us on this call right now are struggling with, with real problems in our lives. We've spoken about the faith of Abraham. We've spoken about how the troubles he faced actually helped him recognize the, the, the weaknesses in his own life. But now we also learn that that's not enough. We must recognize the weakness. We must trust in God but we also have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to, to help us to understand the word of God, to help us be faithful and to help us be obedient. And we know, God, that your Bible teaches that you will give us the Holy Spirit if we ask for it. Because with that, we can see heaven. And I pray for ourselves, the Tofi family, uh, our new baby boy that's been born um, for second service as a church, for those who need help, the welfare fund, all these different things. May you help them make the right decisions to support the church. Just like Paul, sitting in prison, supported the church at Ephesus and Colossae. And we ask, Lord, that you may look at us and say, Second Service, Claremont Church, Kurt, Claudia, uh, everyone, they are walking with Christ and are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.